Son like him, I uh, pray this morning that uh, we would understand that uh, and come to understand that in a, in a fresh and a new way. And, uh, it's great to be here this morning, as I mentioned before. Uh, we are going to open our Bibles to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, uh, verses 38 through 42. That's Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And as you're getting there... Um, you can go Luke, uh, go to your New Testament, uh, probably about three quarters of the way through the Bible if you were to hold the Bible up, and uh, Luke is the third book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, then Luke, and Luke is between Mark and John. So as you're getting there, I want you to contemplate this question, what frustrates you? Or a more accurate question might be, who frustrates you. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe your neighbor blows his leaves on, uh, on your front yard or, or, or parks his car uh, on your grass. Uh, maybe it's the driver in front of you. Maybe it's the engineer who designed the toy that you will try to build or are trying to build at that Christmas Eve uh, night. And you're wondering, why is this thing so complicated? Uh, maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's the people who manage the grocery store. Why do they only seem to have two cash-out aisles open when there's a thousand people in the store? Um, this one, according to many of the posts I see on Facebook these days, seems to be a big source of frustration. Maybe it's our elected officials. <laughs> Is frustration a sinful thing? Is frustration a sinful thing? Uh, I'd argue no. Uh, it's an emotion. Uh, we are created in the image of God. God is a God of emotions. We see that throughout the Bible. Uh, God is a jealous God. God is an angry God. God is a God uh, who rejoices. Uh, and we've been created with emotions just like God. However, the difference between us and God is God is holy. And every part of our being is corrupted by sin. Even my emotions are corrupted uh, by sin. So the emotion itself, frustration, is not a sin. There's, there's things to be frustrated at. We recognize they're wrong in the world. We recognize that. We recognize there are things that happen that should not be. But what we do with that emotion, that's where we get ourselves in trouble. See, with God, God's emotions never cause him to move contrary to his own will. But it's not the same with us. We sin when we move in the emotion. So think about it. You're at that food store, and there's only two checkout lines available, and they're 20 people deep, and you think to yourself, man, I'm, you know, what's this manager doing? I'm going to give this manager a piece of my mind. I got, you know, you got to open up another checkout line. This is wrong. Or uh, maybe there's a situation where you say, you know what? Same situation. I'm going to go to the food store. My wife asked me to go to the food store. I'm going to get a couple things for her. I get there, I'm like, no, I'm not waiting in this line. I'm not doing this. I'm going to leave. So there's attack or retreat. And the sin occurs when we move into the, emo into the emotion and then move into the position of making ourselves a God, little g. This isn't right. This shouldn't be happening. I know best. I'm going to assert my will upon everyone else. Or I'm going to let the whole world know how wrong this situation is and I don't like it. Or I'm going to leave. The sin occurs when we move according to our own thoughts and desires instead of moving into God <coughs> and His Word. Now, if you find this sermon to be impactful... One of the reasons is, is because, as my family can attest to, I get easily frustrated. 
and I don't always handle it in a godly way. So uh, I will be the first to, to confess to you that, you know, these words, I'm preaching to myself, and I have preached to myself. Um, but Psalm 4 gives us some guidance here. Be angry and do not sin. See, the anger is not. It's not sin. It's what we do with the anger, what we do with the frustration. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. What are right sacrifices? Well, Psalm 51 tells us a right sacrifice is a broken and contrite heart. When we recognize our own sin, we're so quick to take these fingers and point them at other people. But right sacrifices are when we take those fingers and we point them right back here. And we recognize within our own selves, we're sinners. Just like the people we might be expressing frustration at. You know, and God is sovereign over all things. Of all the people you could live next door to, you live next door to the people that God's put there. Of all the people that could be over you in your work, your boss, you know who's put that person there? God. Of all the times you could have walked into the supermarket, you walked in at this time. God knew. And God's sovereign over all things. And when we express frustration, who are we actually expressing our dissatisfaction in and with? It's God. Now, nobody's going to say that out loud. Nobody would say, oh, no, I'm, I'm angry. No, I'm not angry with God. I'm angry with, I'm angry with the manager here at the, at the food store. I'm angry with my boss. I'm, I'm frustrated. Well, who put you in that relationship? Who put you in that situation? And more importantly, why? Does God want us to be frustrated? He doesn't. He wants us to, to know life, to have life, and to have it abundantly. You know, think, about, think about the life of Christ. All the things that he saw, that he knew, he knew what was right. And I'm not talking with everybody, just think about the disciples. How frustrated he might have been. So when I experience frustration, is that a me problem or is that a God problem? Who's deficient? Who is the problem with? You know, our emotions, I want you to imagine the, the dashboard of a car. If you're driving down 575 at 70 miles an hour and the check engine light goes on or the check tire light goes on, what should you do? Stop. Pull over, check the engine, check the oil, check the tire. The problem's not with the dashboard. The dashboard's working perfectly. It's a little warning light saying, hey, you need to stop and pull over. There's, there's, there's a bigger problem you're going to experience than this annoying little light. If you keep going down this road as fast as you're going, if you don't stop and pull over and seek to understand, there are going to be bigger problems than a little yellow, annoying yellow, or annoying red light on the dashboard. See, the dashboard works perfectly. When my frustration, now imagine your emotions, when my frustration light goes on, or anger light goes on, or anxiety light goes on, or fear light goes on, there's not a problem with my emotion. There are some things to be fearful of. There are some things that we're frustrated by. There are some things that we recognize aren't right that would cause us anger. But what I need to do is I, need, I know myself. 
I know who I am. I need to stop and pull over. Why? Why am I frustrated? Is this a righteous anger? Is this, am I frustrated because somehow God is being attacked? Or am I frustrated because I'm not getting what I want? Or maybe I'm losing something I really want to hold on to. I think a lot of times for us as human beings, frustration is an indication that we have lost our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who he is, what he has done, and what he has promised. And when we lose focus, we wander. And when we wander, we become susceptible to temptation. All right, so now then, let's turn to our passage and see how one of our sisters in the faith became frustrated. And how Jesus ministered to her in her moment of frustration. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from Uh, Lord, we come before you right now. Your word is living and active. Father, we thank you for Luke and his documenting this account of you visiting Mary and Martha. We thank you that they are, these words are words given to us for us to help us to understand how to live for you and according to your word. Help us right now to be vigilant and staying focused. Open our eyes, ears, hearts, and minds. Lord, that you would be glorified. Love and praise you. In Jesus' name. So I want us to take our time moving through this passage so that God's word can have its full effect upon us this morning. So let's start with the first key phrase which we find in verse 38. Jesus entered a village. What did Jesus do when he went into villages? He performed miracles and preached the good news. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 Jesus has just been anointed with the Holy Spirit, been led out to the wilderness. He's been tempted for 40 days uh, by Satan, and now he starts to go out. And the words of Christ, the words of Matthew about Christ says, From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus went out, he performed miracles, and he preached the good news. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Here it is, the kingdom of heaven. And we must remember that Jesus came so that each of us would recognize our sin, confess it, turn from it, and turn to him. Jesus came for relationship. Remember that. And what did Martha do? A woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So here's Jesus. He enters this village. And this village, by the way, it's named Bethany. It's just outside of Jerusalem. He enters this village. And he doesn't just walk up and he happen happens to be walking past Martha's house. He enters this village and he's preaching the good news. And what has happened is Martha and Mary have come to faith. And so what do they do? They welcome him into their house. Well, how do I know that? 
Well, there's a couple. It's really important as we read scripture and we always read it in context. So I've taken here these several verses in the midst of chapter 10. It's actually towards the end of chapter 10. But if we go back to the beginning of chapter 10, what do we see? We see that Christ has sent out the 72. I'm going to read the first several verses. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Harvest, Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. So, Jesus has commissioned these 72 to do this. Jesus himself is doing the same things. And so we see just in these verses that the son, what is a son of peace? It's one who's put his trust in the son, Jesus Christ. And so I would argue that this is one Indication that Martha has repented and acknowledged Jesus as Lord. The other is, if we go back to our block of scripture here, verse 40, how does she address Jesus? She uses the word Lord. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to call somebody Lord? Well, in the Greek, the word is kurios. And it means the owner, the one who has control of the person, the master. She's acknowledging Jesus' sovereignty. She's acknowledging that Jesus is the Christ. She's, she's acknowledging you're the Messiah. And Jesus calls us to submit to him, not out of a spirit of domination, but out of a spirit of necessity. She recognized her need. She recognized her sin. <laughs> She recognized she couldn't save herself through a good work. She recognized her need for Christ as her Savior, and she recognized him to be the truth. Verse 39, the first part of it, 39a, and she had a sister called Mary. You know, interesting, the word sister that is used here is the word Adelphi. It's a Greek word, and it means a sister by birth. But it also can be used to identify a sister in Christ. So someone who would be, you would use this word as a sister or who spiritually is a sister. So it can be used to demonstrate both a physical and spiritual relationship. And so this word right here has a double meaning because Mary is both her physical sister and spiritual sister. Here's the one thing I want us to remember as brothers and sisters in Christ, is that people, especially those who we call brother or sister, they're not our enemies. Satan and his evil forces are. Everyone we see, everyone we know, is created by God in his image. People aren't our enemies, especially those within the family of Christ. Listen to this verse from Ephesians chapter 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Okay, then, so Mary, what was she doing? She sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Well, why was she doing this? What was her motive? 
Well, she recognized her need for wisdom. She wanted to know. She recognized that Christ had come for relationship. And she wanted to know him more. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 34 through 35 read, Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. In Proverbs 3, verse 13, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. Blessed is that person. How do we get that? By sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But turn back to our text. Verse 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving. But Martha. That introduces a contrast to Mary and her actions. But Martha. She was distracted. What was she? By what was she distracted? Serving. And from whom was she distracted? The Lord. And from what was she distracted? His teaching. See, it says, But Martha was distracted with much serving. Much, a large amount. Serving, actually the word here means ministering. And so clearly the context of this verse tells us that poor Martha has her priorities out of order. Because ministering in itself, that can't be a bad thing, right? But she was distracted by it. See, serving the Lord's not the issue. Because serving God and his people is a good thing. But not if it is disconnected from God and from his word. Martha thinks... She, she does. She thinks she has everything rightly ordered. And she's fully confident of this. In fact, she's so blinded by her self-righteousness and the frustration that this self-righteousness evoked that she does a very brazen thing. She approaches the Lord Jesus Christ without any fear, without any awe, without any reverence. And she went up to him. How did she go up to him? She marched right up to him. The Greek word used here is ephistime. And it means to stand over one or to place oneself above. She didn't come humbly. She didn't come... Uh, Jesus, can I, can I talk with you for a second? No, she marched right up to him. And what does she say? Lord, do you not care? Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her. Tell her then to help me. What is Martha doing here? She is rebuking Jesus. What she's saying here is, hey, I know you're Jesus, but right now you're not doing a really good job of being Jesus, so let me help you out here, okay? Let me, let me show you how to be a better Jesus, okay? Because, look, I, I'm trying to make everything Go really good. I want to make sure everybody's got the right amount of food and everybody's, the drinks are, and, and look at her. She's just sitting there. Come on. You're her Lord too. Tell her. Get with it. She doesn't even see how she is just, just put herself right up to the top. And you know, Jesus, if you do a better job of being Jesus, this whole thing, It'll flow a lot better. Like people will really, they'll really be able to hear what you have to say. But you got to get with it. You know, this is absolutely, it's a stunning act. And you know, we, we laugh about it. 
because there is, there is some humor in it because I think we can all relate to that blindedness. I know I can. And you know, have you ever been at a gathering where someone speaks completely out of turn to another who's their superior? Maybe you had a sibling who made the mistake of uh, disrespectfully speaking to one of your parents uh, around the dinner table. Or maybe you were at a work meeting where a colleague called out his or her superior in front of the entire group. Can you remember an event like that? I was actually, I was actually that guy in both situations uh, in, in my life. Uh, I'm ashamed to say, and it it went as bad as you could you would imagine it would go. Uh, you know, put yourself in the superior's position. If you had an underling who called you out in front of a group of people, what would be your reaction? I know what mine would be. The only thing more stunning than Martha's rebuke is Jesus's response. Of all the things that Jesus could have said and or done, look at how he responds to Martha. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. Martha, Martha. Such a gentle rebuke. Such a caring rebuke. Such a needed rebuke. In Hebrew, repeating a name twice... <coughs> is an expression of intimacy. And it's actually done uh, about two handfuls of time throughout Scripture. I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. You're familiar with these. these. These examples will stir your mind. But repeating a name in Hebrew, it is, it is an expression of intimacy. In Genesis 22, just before Abraham is about to plunge the knife into Isaac, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. In Exodus, in chapter 3, Moses is out tending to the flock and he sees this burning bush and he approaches it. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. In Genesis 46, as Jacob, who was renamed Israel, was preparing to take his family down to Egypt to be reunited with Joseph, and God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here I am. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 3, as God was preparing to commission the great prophet Samuel, and the Lord came and stood calling, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Well, why does Jesus repeat Martha's name? For one thing, it shows Christ's great concern for Martha. He loves Martha. And in fact, in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 5, uh, John tells us that explicitly. It reads, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, who was their brother. So he speaks to her affectionately because he wants her to understand that, first, that fact first and foremost. I love you. I want you to know I care for you. Secondly, he does it to get her attention. It signals that what he's about to tell her is very important. It's truth. She needs to set her heart on hearing just as Abraham, Moses, Jacob, and Samuel had. And then what does he say? Verse 41. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. What things was Martha anxious and troubled by? I would argue, was her perception among the people. She had a vision for how this gathering should go. And at the end of it, she wanted Jesus to be pleased and the people to be pleased. She wanted people to come up to her at the end of this gathering and say, that was fantastic, you did a great job. Wow, you know, I can't believe how well you pulled that off. And 
Martha had made herself a little idol. She wanted to be seen as someone worthy to host the Lord. She wanted to be seen as somebody worthy to host the Lord in her house. And she was doing everything she could think of to meet those expectations. But it wasn't enough, and it wasn't going as she had planned. And her idol was falling apart right before her eyes. So what does she do? She turns to Jesus and says, I can't do all this serving that you've called me to do by myself. I need your help here. And it starts with getting my sister to get up and start pulling her weight. Verse 42. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. One thing is necessary. What is it? It's the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus hadn't entered Martha's house and Martha's life in order that she might start serving him. He entered her life so that she might know him. And have rest in him. And enjoy him forever. See, Christ saves not to make us butlers and maids. Not to make us his personal servants. Christ saves to make us heirs, friends, siblings, a bride. Christ does not come into our lives to make us prove our worthiness to him. When Jesus comes into our presence, it's not so that we audition for him, like on American Idol. So Mary, I see you're from Bethany, and you'll be performing uh, I Love You, Lord, a dramatic performance. Okay, let's see what you got. Mary does her little act, and hey, you know, that wasn't too bad, but uh, you are going to get to move on to the next round, but... It gets more competitive from here, so make sure that you get a little more creative and you do a little better job next time around when we come and we judge how you're doing. That's not, that's not who, who Christ is, but I think sometimes we get caught up in that. You know, the scripture says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. See, Mary had chosen a good portion. Mary chose Jesus. Mary chose to be with Jesus, to make him her priority. She was done with worldliness and seeking to perform for the applause of the world. Mary understood that she was not worthy. She understood that she was a sinner, and there was nothing she could do to make herself right with God. But she also understood there was nothing she had to do. For it's Jesus that promises, and Jesus that provides, and Jesus that fulfills. She had understood the message of the gospel, that it was by grace, through faith, in Christ, that one becomes born again and finds peace with God. Mary also understood that this portion would not be taken from her. Her salvation was not based on her performance, but on the promises of Christ. Numbers 23, 23 19 reads, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? In, in Titus 1, chapter 2, In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Mary chose to rest in Christ, to seek guidance from Christ. She knew that she had entered into a new relationship with a new Lord, and by taking the time to sit at his feet, she was seeking to understand how to do and what to do and when to do 
not just for her good, but for the good of others and for God's glory. Maybe today you find yourself more like Martha, who on that day was anxious and troubled by many things. Maybe you feel overwhelmed by the work that Jesus has set before you. And you find that these burdens aren't light, and they're not easy. But in fact, they're heavy and tiresome. And Martha was a believer, and I have no doubt that other believers will see her in heaven, but she was having a tough day. She had her eyes fixed on the things of the world, the task that made her old master the devil kept keep whispering in her ear, your food isn't ready. Now the room's not as clean as it should be. Your people need more sweet tea. She was listening to that voice instead of the voice of God. And she had her eyes set on meeting the world's standards and not God's. And and God in love needed to gently discipline her for her good. He needed to get her attention focused back on him and the truth. What things do you find yourself anxious and troubled by today? Maybe it's a health concern. Or a broken relationship with a loved one. Or a financial issue. Or it's, maybe it's the spiritual condition of our country. Or a calling issue. God, where do you want me to go? What am I supposed to do? Well, what should you do with these things? Bring them to the feet of Jesus and sit down next to him like a child with these things. You might say, well, how do I do that? Well, let me show you. First off, make time. Mary chose the good portion. Mary, what does she do? She could have done, she had the same amount of time as Martha. She could have done anything she wanted. She made time. See, we need to stop running around with all our serving and then lashing out at God and other people because we aren't getting what we want or things aren't going our way or things aren't going the way we think they should go. I mean, did you ever stop to wonder that maybe God is preventing you because the way that you're headed is a dangerous way? Or maybe the things you want or the direction you're headed are actually not good for you at all. So stop. Rest. Visit. Contemplate. And once you've stopped running around like a chicken with your head cut off, pray to God. You, you'll notice that the account of Martha and Mary that I just read to you, it immediately transitions into the Lord teaching his disciples how to pray. And this is not by accident. You know, Luke didn't just, like, okay, let me see, I'll take this piece and put it here, and what should go next? Or, you know, it wasn't just some stream of consciousness. There's amazing order in God's word. And... Those that are in Christ and find themselves anxious and troubled today need to get with the Lord in prayer. Father, may your name be hallowed. You know, I might pray something like this. Lord, I want to see your name be hallowed. I want to see, I let people see less of me and more of you. I'm your servant. I don't like this right now. It hurts. And I know you know that. But I also know that everything you do is with purpose. And so may, may I be obedient. May I wait. May I seek to have your name be hallowed in and through this frustrating experience. Give us our daily bread. God, you're the provider of all things. You provide everything that's necessary. 
not only for me physically, but spiritually. And right now, in this moment where I'm experiencing frustration, <clears throat> Lord, I know you will provide, whether it's through memory, whether it's through another person, I know you will provide wisdom for me as to how to conduct myself right now. Forgive me. Lord, forgive me for I have sinned against you. Even if people, even if I haven't expressed my frustration yet, you know the frustration in my heart. And it's not a godly frustration. It's a Mike Martin self-righteous frustration. Lord, forgive me for I've sinned against you. When we stop to do that, It changes everything. Why? Because I'm no longer looking at my neighbor or the person driving in front of me or the long line in the checkout or my boss. Who am I looking to? I'm looking to Christ, my Lord and Savior. And when I look to Christ, what happens? It impacts my thinking. All of a sudden, I remember. I remember who Christ is. I remember what Christ has done. I remember what's to come. I remember that this is a momentary and temporary affliction. I remember I'm not worthy. I remember it's by the grace of God that I stand right here, right now, to even be frustrated. And when my thinking changes, that impacts my heart. And from my heart flow my actions. And once you've confessed and repented of prayer, well, you look down just a little bit farther, Luke chapter 11, verse 9. Jesus says, And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Ask, seek, and knock for the wisdom to change. Here's the key. But then at some point, you've got to open your Bible to hear from God. God, he's, he could, any way he wants, he could give us wisdom. But here's how it doesn't happen. He doesn't just drop it into our heads. Am I going to make God a priority? Am I going to sit at his feet and hear from him? He's already given me the answers. He's already given me the solution. He's already given me what I need. Am I going to take the time to hear it? And let it change me. Because when we open our Bibles, our eyes get open, our ears get open, our heart and our mind get open. And if knowing and growing in a relationship with Christ is your greatest desire, he will not deny you that privilege. And I'm going to let God have the last word on this matter. Read you just a couple of scriptures. It's from James chapter 4. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Philippians chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That verse, that first line, I'm going to read it again. Do this. The second line, it's a promise. God promises his peace. Listen, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, that's your role, let your request be made known to God. Here comes the promise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's relationship. Finally, Luke chapter 21. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with the cares of this life. Let's pray. Our Father, we, uh, we come before you recognizing Recognizing our sin, Lord. Recognizing that 
Father, we live in a sinful world, and when we see things that are wrong, we try to act like you. We try to make things right according to how we think they are right and how they should be. And Lord, we exalt ourselves above you. But we don't even take the time to contemplate that you're, you're so in that moment, in this moment, right now, you are sovereign. You brought us here together. You brought us here today to hear this word. You put it in my heart to preach this word today. You've done it. Lord, we come before you uh, with thanksgiving. You know our hearts. Uh, you know the cares and concerns of every single person in this room right now. Father, I pray that we would take the time with you. You, you're, you're, you as the Holy Spirit are in our house. Which, you, your person is within our person. You have done everything. You want us to come to you. I pray that we would make the time to do that. In those moments of emotion, that we would stop and pull over, come to you, seek you, and be amazed. And that then we would go forward in a way in which we can be a blessing to other people and point people to the hope that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, forgive us, help us. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that in our sin, you respond to us gently. May we hear you repeat our names in those moments softly. And may we be ever attentive and turn to you. Father, we love you. We praise you. We rejoice that we can go forward in the remainder of this day exalting Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I pray that everyone has a, a blessed remainder of this Lord's Day, and as I have in you know, the past Sundays, we close you with uh, words from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Hopefully some of you are starting to pick up on them by now, so you, you know if I get them wrong, you'll be able to correct me. Uh, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you.